The book of Genesis comes to an end in this chapter. The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. It begins with creation and it ends with a coffin. It begins with the um, glory of God and it ends with man in slavery in a foreign country. We see in this book, and by the way, the book of Genesis is the entire Bible in miniature. And we see in this book that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And Joseph is going away now through the route of death. And his followers must walk by faith and not by sight. They are left in Egypt for 400 years. And there they are to believe the promises of God that God will surely visit you. Verse 24, and Joseph said unto his brethren, I die and God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land into the land which he sware to our father Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now you've probably seen the type already. This world is a type of Egypt or Egypt is a type of this world. Our Joseph has died and resurrected and ascended and gone back to heaven. We are here to walk by faith and not by sight. And the thing that is to keep us on track is the promises of God. You understand? And so having not seen him, we love him. And so Egypt is a type of the world. And uh, while we're in this world, there's basically only two ways out. And uh, we're going to talk about that um, this morning. Now, both of these require a visit from God. Now, the Lord has made some special visitation down through time. When somebody visits, you usually hope it's a visit. We've seen people who have visited. We wondered if they were ever going to leave. We were not sure that this visit is a visit. Maybe it's a new move in. But we understand that a visit means that a person is coming for, to deliver some information, a message. He's coming to escort you to some other place. A visitor is coming to fellowship for a brief period of time. But a visitor is someone who comes because there is a message, uh, some kind of uh, uh, thing, something that they must carry out. and. Uh, Usually it's a special event. Now God has visited man on special occasions for special tasks. And uh, in this text, Joseph said, God will surely visit you. Now the implication was not that God was not available. God is everywhere, isn't he? But the idea is that beyond the omnipresence of God, there is some special event that is going to take place. And that is called a visitation from God. As a matter of fact, there are three visitations that I want to call to your attention this morning. The first visitation that we're concerned and interested in would be what we call the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there you read in John's gospel, if you'll turn there, in John chapter 1, the, the writer of John introduces the heavenly guest, and he introduces him as a visitor. In John chapter 1, New Testament, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the same was in the beginning with God. John 1, 3. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, that is, John was not, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That's interesting. John knew what his job description was. Have you found what your job description as a Christian is? John knew his. He knew that his job description was to be a witness. You see it. He was not that light, verse 8, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Visitation. 
Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came to his own visitation, and his own received him not. Now occasionally, only pastors experience this, but occasionally when I go to visit folks and I knock on the door, I mean it sounds like a party is going on when I get there, and once you knock on the door, it's as quiet as a cemetery at 3 o'clock in the morning. And somebody has looked out the window and said, it's the pastor. And everybody, you know, they play freeze, you know, and everybody just freezes. Nobody answers the door. I just keep knocking, you know, try the door. If it's open, I just go on in. But, uh, you know, a lot of folks, uh, when you visit, you're not welcome. It's very difficult. Some people have to pretend that. Now, the thing about the Lord Jesus is he came to visit. 2,000 years ago, he visited this planet from outer space. And he visited, and the sad thing is he was not welcome. Down in verse 11, it says, He came to his own, and his own received him not. How did he come to his own? He came to his own planet by virtue of creation. He made it. It's his. This planet doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. Mankind is a custodian of it. Just like this lady is a custodian of this little baby. And uh, this planet belongs to God uh, the Father, and he created it, and his son came. He came to his own. Not only did he come to his own creation, he came to his own people, the Jews. He came to his own. He didn't come to angels. He came to mankind. He came to his own. When our Lord came, the book of Hebrews says, he took not upon him the nature of angels, but upon him the seed of Abraham. So he came to his own. He came and visited and he made a heavenly call. And when he came, they refused him and said, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so he came to his own, in verse 11, and his own received him not. Now you see, folks, the way you get saved is you receive somebody. That's how you get saved. You don't get saved by joining a church. You don't get saved by getting baptized. You don't get saved by being sprinkled. You don't get saved by being confirmed. You don't get saved by being a deacon, an elder, a pastor, a bishop, an evangelist, or a missionary. You don't get saved by being born into the right denomination. You get saved by receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. That's how you get saved. And the reason these people didn't get saved is because they didn't receive him when he made his visit. Notice it says in verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. So when people received him, when they received the heavenly visitor, they got eternal life. And you never get eternal life until you receive the heavenly guest. You understand that? Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Turn to the left. Matthew, Mark, Luke chapter 1 and verse 68. Luke 1, 68. It said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Now here is old Zacharias. He's a prophet, or he's a father of John the Baptist. But he said in verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. Now the old, the old man recognized that Jesus Christ, this baby, was God's visitation to Israel to provide redemption. So the old man, when he looked at this baby and looked at his own son, he recognized that redemption was nigh, was nigh at hand. And so he praised the Lord, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God, for he hath visited his people, and he hath redeemed Israel. If you look at verse 78, verse 78 in the same chapter, it says, Through the tender mercies of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. Why, the day spring from on high is a star. And the men said, We have seen his star, and this star hath visited us. And he visited from where? From on high. Many of them knew that this was a heavenly visitor. And Joseph said, God will surely visit you, and he will bring you out of this land. If you'll turn to chapter 7 and verse 16 of the same book, Chapter 7 and verse 16. 7, 16. 
And there came a fear upon all, and they glorified God, saying, that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. So at the first advent of Christ, there were certain people who recognized that God had visited his people. But now listen, the majority of the people didn't recognize the heavenly visitor. He came to his own, his own received him not. He came as a visitor from heaven, prophesied in the Old Testament, a few recognized him as God's visitor to mankind to bring redemption. But he was rejected, he came to his own, and they received him not. Now God will surely visit you, Joseph said. Secondly, if you'll turn with me to the book of Acts, you'll see a second visitation. In Acts chapter 15, you need to turn there and see the second visitation that is taking place. Acts chapter 15 and verse 14. Now we are several years, Acts 15, 14, into the New Testament church. Jesus, by this time, has been crucified, buried, resurrected, and gone back to heaven. The New Testament church has started. The apostle Paul has been converted. He's out on his missionary journeys. He's preaching to the Gentiles, visiting them with the gospel of the grace of God. When he comes back to Antioch, he finds that some Jews have come up from Jerusalem, and they are teaching these new converts that you must be circumcised, keep the law of Moses, and act like a Jew if you want to be a saved Gentile. So the apostle Paul and uh, Barnabas and uh, others go down to Jerusalem and they have the first church conference. While they're there, they argue this issue. Paul stands up, gives his testimony. He and Timothy, or si uh, si Paul and Silas, they give their testimony about how God had opened the door to the Gentiles and saved them by faith when we visited them. Peter, Simon, stood up in verse 7 and said the same thing. He said, I saw a vision from heaven of all manner of unclean beasts. God said to me, rise, kill, and eat, and I said, not so. Three times that vision was let down, and God said to me, what I have cleansed, call not common, get out of here and go take visit the Gentiles and take the gospel to them. He said, I obeyed. And while I was preaching, the uh, Holy Spirit came upon these Gentiles, they were saved, and we believe that we, the Jews, are going to be saved the same way by faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then James, we've had Paul, the spokesman, the missionary, we've had Simon Peter, the evangelist, and now we have James, the pastor at the First Baptist Church at Jerusalem. And he says in verse 14, James speaks up, and he said, Simeon, or Simon, hath declared how that God, now watch it, how that God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Notice James says, Simon Peter has declared how that God at first, now that's not talking about the first advent, it's not talking about the virgin birth, it's not talking about those verses that I read to you previously in the Gospel of Luke and John. This is talking about the first visit of Simon Peter when he went to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. You understand? He's talking about Acts chapter 10. He's talking about a different visitation. In the, in the virgin birth, the first advent of Christ, we have a visitation. God the Son came and visited. He came to his own, and his own received him not. He went back to heaven. He sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God now indwells every believer. Just as John the Baptist had his job description, every believer has his. What is it? Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be what? Witnesses. So my job description as a Christian, not as a pastor, but as a Christian, is to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I do that? Go visiting. Hey, that's what it is. That's what it says. It says that God hath visited. Now, you are his body. Do you know God can't do anything without his body? 
God has handicapped himself to the church. Just as the president of the Boeing airplane company has handicapped the entire organization to the delegates that are under him, he has delegated all the responsibility to his subordinates, given them their job description, and the prosperity of that organization rises and falls on the willingness of the employees to go along with their job description. God the Father, God the Son, left a delegation to the church. He went back to heaven in his body, is seated at the right hand of God. He sent the Holy Spirit. You are his body. Do you understand? Therefore, he has chosen not to visit anybody to get them saved unless his body does it. Heavy, heavy hangs over our head. You understand that? It's not that God couldn't do it. It is that God has chosen in this dispensation to use his body to visit the Gentiles. You understand? Now listen, that's what it means. Therefore he said, listen, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Who's that given to? It's given to his body. Acts 1.8, you shall be witnesses. Well, who do you think he's talking to? He's talking to his body, the believers, people that say they're saved. So God in this dispensation has chosen to visit unsaved people through his body. You know how I got saved? Somebody visited in Wenatchee and a church got started. And as a result of a church being started, I got saved. You know how you folks got saved in this church? Because 19 years ago in October, somebody came to this area and bought 25 folding chairs and 25 psalm books and a little $25 mimeograph machine and started running off flyers and went door to door every day of the week doing what? Visiting. That's how you got saved. Those of you who got saved in this church, it's because somebody did some visiting. You understand that? That's how it happened. God's program for this age is to visit. Joseph said, God will surely visit you. Now listen, just as they didn't know that God was visiting when the Son of God came to this planet, folks today are not a bit smarter. Not a bit smarter. Saved people didn't know what God's program was in that day, and the sad thing is, saved people in the church today don't know what God's program is. Ladies and gentlemen, God's program for this age is to visit the Gentiles through his saved people, taking the grace of God to them that they might be saved. That's God's plan. Look at it again. Verse 14, Simon has declared how that God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Now God's plan is that people get saved. How are they going to get saved? Through his people visiting. Now how do people visit today? How do we visit? How does God visit? Well, God visits from door to door soul winning. Ron Kimmel, a missionary to, uh, to Germany, uh, is on the mission field today because somebody was out visiting. Rocky Locano is, and his family are here today, see, because somebody visited their house. Don and Jean Taylor here this morning, they are saved because Mrs. Blue and I visited their house. You understand? Jerry and Kathy Lundquist are saved because I visited them and led them to Christ. You understand that? It is visitation. Dick Kimball is saved this morning because I visited his house, sat down in the living room with him, and led him to Christ. Do you understand how that works? It is God's plan that we visit and get people saved. These folks right here are saved because I visited their home, sat down at the kitchen table, and led them to Christ. That's how it works. Visitation. Jack and Mae Foster, back in the back, are saved because I visited their home in Sandpoint, Alaska, and sat down in their living room and led them to Christ. That's how, you understand? It's this matter of visiting. That's how folks get saved. That's God's plan. It's not the only way to get saved, but it is God's plan that somebody go visiting. God will surely visit you. How's God going to visit the Gentiles today? A lot of folks say, oh, that happened back there at Pentecost. No, it didn't. They say, well, it happened at the virgin birth. No, it didn't. It started in Acts 10. James says that God first visited the Gentiles through Simon Peter. 
in Acts 10. So God visits through door-to-door -door soul winning. God visits through track. Brother Tom, uh, Tom Tucker got saved in this church. Every noon hour, he stands at Pike Place Market and passes out gospel tracts to those people that come by. And boy, that's a crowd. And he stands there every noon hour and passes out gospel literature. You say, does it work? Well, ask Mike Elstrott back here if it works. He took one of those tracks, came and got saved, and is here this morning. Sure it works. I get letters occasionally from different parts of the country. I had a man to write to me recently from the East Coast who said we were vacationing in the Northwest, and we were down at Pike's Place Market, and this gentleman gave us a gospel track, and it had your church's name on it, and I just want you to know that we praise God that somebody's still trying to get the gospel out. See, not everybody that gets saved comes back to this church. Only eternity will reveal who has been visited by God through Brother Tom passing out gospel tracts. You understand? That's how God visits. See, the problem today is you're not sure how God visits. You think maybe it's an earthquake. See, you're not sure. So when the heavenly visitor comes, you don't know it. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Why? Matthew chapter 25 says, I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was naked, and you clothed me not. I was in prison, and you visited not. And they said, Lord, when did all this happen? Why? They had opportunity to serve God and didn't even know it. And the sad thing about it is God, uh, the, the people are going to be visited by God, and they don't even know it. You know how you're visited? I worked at Boeing for seven years. And some of you folks, maybe you're saved because some fellow employee started talking to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how God visits. God visits through saved men and women sharing their testimony on the job. Uh, family members. Fellow gets saved. One of the first things he's interested in is seeing his mother or his father or his children or brothers and sisters come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And God visits through them. God visits through the television and radio ministry. I had a Catholic priest to write me the other day from Yakima, said, I heard you on the radio, and I'd like to receive one of your tapes. I enjoyed the message. Brother, when a Catholic priest enjoys my preaching, either he's getting right or I'm getting wrong. I'm not sure what's happening here. But thank God that God visits. Wouldn't it be wonderful if this man got saved through this visitation of a cassette tape? God visits. God visits through the pulpit ministry like this morning. God visits through a letter that you may write to an unsaved friend. God may visit through a tragedy and bring you to your knees to where you trust Christ. But I'm telling you, God is visiting in this generation. Listen, try Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. Guess what? For 2,000 years, there's been a heavenly visitor knocking on the door, wanting in, wants in your heart, and he knocks through the instruments that I've just mentioned to you. And some of you unsaved this morning, God has been knocking at your heart's door, wanting in. A young man wrote to me just recently, and he said, my life is getting quite complicated. Well, I'll tell you who can make it uncomplicated is if you let the heavenly visitor take over and let him run the household. He'll take care of that complication. God is not the author of confusion. And if you're frustrated and life is complicated and you're confused, I'll tell you what, it's because you're trying to run things. And the more you make wrong decisions, the more complicated life gets. It's like fishing line. You just keep getting it tangled up, and you either have to stop and untangle it, or you take the, take the pen knife out and you keep cutting pieces out of it. The problem with that is you run out of fishing line eventually. And so you need to let the master fisherman untangle it or give you a whole new fishing tackle, one or the other. God will surely visit you, last of all. God is going to visit at the rapture of the church, if you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means we'll not all be dead when the Lord returns. That could be him. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you see it, verse 52, at the last trump, 
for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this incorruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed in victory. O death, where is thy sting? That's what the living people will say. Those people that went up out of Egypt on foot, they went across the Red Sea singing, O death, where is thy victory? They didn't die in Egypt. They went out under the hand of God, the leadership of God, out of Egypt, right through the Red Sea to the Promised Land. You understand me? What about Joseph? And the Bible says clearly that they carried Joseph's bones out and he went out with them. And so Joseph, when he went out, he was crying, O grave, where is thy victory? Both of them came out of Egypt, one of them alive and the other dead, but they both went out. And so in our text, verse 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Conclusion. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Why? God will surely visit you. That's why it's not in vain. God will surely visit you. Now listen, if the Lord tarries, most of us are headed for the cemetery if the Lord waits another. However, I believe with all of my heart, I may be wrong, but I've never been more convinced of anything that there are many people sitting right here this morning who will live to see the return of Christ. I believe that. I believe it. I'm not setting any dates, but I believe that. But I'm telling you, if the Lord tarries, some of us are going to go to heaven by route of death. There's two ways out of Egypt. One's in a coffin, and one's in the, uh, being carried out alive. You understand? And that's how he took them out. Some of them went through the Red Sea alive. Some of them went in a coffin, but they all went. And whether you live at the return of Christ or whether you are dead when he gets here, you're going out and going to heaven. And that's what this text says. And in our text, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. One last reference. Turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You need to see it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. Now, the Apostle Paul says, I mean, it's okay to weep when, when someone dies, but there are different kinds of tears. There are tears of regret, tears of remorse. There are tears of sorrow, tears of joy, tears of anguish. There are, te there are all kinds of tears. Now, he doesn't say that it's wrong to weep over those who have died, but he says you don't have to have sorrow like those who have no hope. Now, if you die without Jesus Christ, uh, I mean, it, it, there's no need to have anybody to pray for you. It's too late. All the prayer and the gifts and the beads will never get you out of purgatory. First of all, there, there ain't no such place. You understand? Verse 13, For I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Here it is that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God, there it is again, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. You shall not leave my bones in Egypt. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. We go out together. We all go through the Red Sea at the same time, the living and the dead. We go through the Red Sea at the same time. And our Lord, when he visits the next time, he takes us through, out of Egypt, through the Red Sea, right up to the Promised Land. You understand that? John chapter 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, visit, and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. All right. Three visits. The first one was at his birth. Physically, 
was born of a virgin, came to this planet, lived 33 years, offered the kingdom to Israel and salvation to anybody that wanted it. A few, a very few, recognized him and acknowledged him. But by and large, he was rejected, for he was in the world. The world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He went back to heaven. He sent the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to indwell believers. He gave them a commission. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. Hey, there it is again. So send I you. Send I you. Visiting. And so God's program for the last 2,000 years has been to send his body with the gospel message to visit unsaved people that they might get saved, get baptized, join a local church, and go visiting. You get it? It's not hard to understand, is it? Now, as a Christian, that's my job description. As a pastor, I have other things to do. As a Christian, that's his job description. As an assistant pastor, he has other things to do. As a Christian, that's his job description. As a song leader and a family man and, an empl and a worker in a secular world, he has other things to do. You understand? But as a Christian, we all have the same job description. Visit to get people saved. Thirdly, one of these days in the very near future, sooner than most people would like to think, our heavenly visitor is going to visit again in the flesh. He is going to come with clouds. The trumpet is going to sound. The dead in Christ, Joseph and his crowd, are going to be caught up. And the living are going to go with them right up through the Red Sea into the Promised Land. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now let me ask you, have you been visited lately, radio message, family member, gospel tract, television, somebody been bugging you about getting saved, somebody been talking to you about this thing of being saved, guess what? <laughs> you have been visited. What are you going to do about it? You going to do just what they did at his first visit? You going to reject him? Or are you going to accept him? Now, I'll tell you what. Just as there were those that were left behind the first visit, there are those in this age that are not going to accept Christ. Most people are not, but a few will. When he visits the next time, those who reject him, when he visits, will be left behind. Of course, that's another story. My concern for you this morning is that you not be left behind. My concern for you this morning is that you trust Christ as your personal Savior. Now, if you haven't, just like this little girl here that dedicated this baby. She said, I got saved last Saturday. Do you notice she didn't hesitate? She knows she's saved. See? Are you saved? Hmm? Are you? Does anybody know it besides you and God? Are you living up to your job description as a Christian? Are you? Are you ready for the next visit? What if it happened this afternoon? Would you be ready or would you be left behind?